If we were gonna disassemble a great screenplay, take it apart and examine it, what would we find? Uh, if, if we disassemble a great screenplay, um, try to reverse engineer it and, and construct our own based on that, uh -huh. um, what you uh, would find in it is uh, various, let's call them techniques or tools that a screenwriter has used to keep the audience engaged so that when you are, when the curtain goes up or you click the button and it says streaming, <laughs> that, that uh, from that moment uh, there are, they're manipulating your mind, your brain, uh, using various tools and techniques so that uh, to keep you uh, going from moment to moment. And um, the, the, the first book that I did, The, the Sequence Approach. Oh, let's this, see it. This, this, this fine volume okay. um, was actually, uh, it, it sequences are in the title and it's the, how the organizing principle of the book. But I actually thought sequences are kind of like the hook to get the reader to learn about all the other things, techniques that you can use to keep an audience interested. Um, so it's like there hadn't been a book explicitly about the sequence approach before this. Um, and so I thought, well, that's a good angle to use. But there's, once you get the concept, it's pretty simple to understand. Um, but what goes on in the sequences and what tools that filmmakers use, storytellers use to keep you interested, that's fascinating to me too. And so this was, a, I thought, a good way um, to get you interested so that you can learn about these other things that, that filmmakers do. Um, and uh, so specifically the kinds of things you'll find, um, let, let's, let's start out at the beginning. <laughs> what do you do? Um, there is a lot of thought and work out there about three-act structure and the act structure, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and in the very beginning of a movie, you can throw all that out. It's not really about that sort of thing. It's really about, it tends to be about human curiosity. A, can you come up with a puzzle? Can you come up with some interesting uh, image or some line of dialogue or something that is puzzling? It leaves a gap in our understanding and makes us wonder. Uh, uh, what the answer is. And people, many times, the, com the, the common wisdom was, you got to hook an audience, a reader, in the first 10 pages of your screenplay. Okay? You got to hook them by the first 10 pages. And I always felt that there's no reason why you can't hook them on the first page. All you have to do is raise a question in the, in the reader's mind on the first page and then promise them an answer on page two. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll turn the page. You know, implicitly, you know, you'll get an answer. Uh, and then on page two, it, you get the answer, but then there's maybe a couple more, more questions raised. And then you want to find out, and you keep turning, and then once you, you're in there, you're hooked. Um, so the reader's hooked. Uh, so generally, you, you'll see, we'll begin with some kind of puzzle, uh, something that is, um, intrigues us. Uh, possibly the main character, but not always, is involved in that. And then um, as the answers come, you can get um, a uh, start to get to know a person, usually the classical formulation. You uh, see oftentimes somebody struggling to try to get something and then they get it. We don't really know them yet, but we start to develop a sense of connection with a character. Um, and that, if we're looking at a main character hooked in the first uh, part of the page, uh, introduced early in this film, they're not always that way, but uh, often, then um, once you're there, then you're going to see uh, tools. Um, well, I guess we can talk about what I identify in the book as the four main tools uh, that filmmakers use in, uh, that I've observed screenwriters and by extension filmmakers use in keeping an audience engaged. And um, 
the most obvious one that you'll see uh, goes by a couple different names. Uh, it's, I call it telegraphing, which can be a negative thing in acting. You're not supposed to telegraph your emotions, that kind of thing, but it's a different sense of the term. Telegraphing, or it's also known as advertising. It's also known as, uh, in theater, I've seen it called uh, signposts or finger posts. It's just simply telling the audience what is coming. Uh, a purely narrative function. And the thing to keep in mind is that drama, unlike a novel, drama uh, is about something that hasn't happened yet. So it's particularly obsessed with the future. It's about what's creating anticipation in the audience. A novel, you've got a narrator, the narrator tells you something that already happened before. Uh, and you can rely on the narrator to give you all the information. Uh, a play and a movie hasn't happened yet. And that's why you'll see since the beginning, they are a stage play and a screenplay. They're instructions and they're written in the present tense. This goes here, this goes there, this person does that. And then, so that's, that's why you have that. So uh, that tense, because it's about, it's a description about something the audience is about to see and how you do that, how the filmmakers or the play uh, actors are supposed to do it. So, uh, with that in mind, telegraphing is, can be something as simple as a character, uh, what's called an appointment. A character says, um, uh, I'll uh, meet you at Jerry's Juiceteria at five o'clock. Okay. So what does that mean? Um, because film is selective, we don't generally start a camera and just keep it running for an hour and a half. You cut to different places. You like to keep the audience oriented. So if you tell the audience, uh, two characters say, I'm see you at Jerry's Juice of Terry at five o'clock and we'll talk then. Then when you cut to Jerry's Juice of Terry, you don't have to explain why you're there. <clears throat> You've already anticipated it. Um, so a simple appointment is an example of that. A deadline has more emotional freight to it. It's like you have a certain number of hours to get a certain thing done. Um, and so uh, it can put time pressure on a character. But also, it also shapes the overall picture, picture too. Uh, it, can, it can be used for that. Uh, for example, there's a couple of these that have deadlines. 500 days of summer comes along. Okay, so it's gradually counting up. It skips around, but you know when you get to 500, eh, the story's going to be over. Uh, Julie and Julia, I think it was called. Okay, so what was that? They're going to do um, the... Uh, uh, all the recipes in the book. One a day. Okay. So when you get to recipe 300, guess what? You know, the movie's probably going to end before pretty soon. <laughs> You're not going to go on another hour or two. And, and that helps shape uh, an audience's um, sense of where to invest its energy. I think we've all been in a situation where we watch a movie, we think it's over, and then it just keeps going. I thought it was done. And then we're sapped of energy and we're like, how, long, how much longer is this going on? Uh, and that just simply means that the filmmaker hasn't, the storyteller hasn't signaled to the audience properly when the big moment is. And sometimes you can do that with simple telegraphing. The movie I'm trying to think of, in American Beauty, it begins with a voice, a disembodied voice saying, in, uh, in a year I'll be dead. That's a deadline for you. You know, and so this is... Um, give us a sense, well, we're going to, this movie will take place in, over the course of a year. You know that implicitly. Okay, so that happened at the beginning of that movie. More typically, uh, telegraphing is just used internally to give, keep us oriented. Um, you have uh, in Toy Story, the opening, it's well, very well-crafted movie, uh, where you have a, the birthday parties coming. So you just have a, a sign that says birthday, happy birthday. So we know what's about to happen. Um, and then there's a reference to we're moving in a week. Okay, so there's a deadline. This movie will take place in one week. Um, and it helps, or let's go to Pizza Planet. These are all examples within it. So now we're going there. And there's another couple of scenes between that moment. Um, so that's, that's one tool that you will see in, the, in movies that manage the tension and keep you interested and keep you going. Um, that one has purely narrative function, not really uh, emotional. Uh, one that has more emotion is, uh, I talked about this before, it's a term called uh, dangling cause. 
uh, you have cause and effect. And uh, this term applies to a cause that doesn't have an effect immediately. It dangles. So uh, it's uh, instead of a character saying, um, instead of a boy likes girl, therefore boy kisses girl, it's boy likes girl and says, I will kiss her, you know, before the day is up. <laughs> and then you'll have a bunch of scenes. And, but you're waiting. You're, it pushes the audience's attention into the future. Well, is it going to happen or not? Um, so you'll have a character give a warning to somebody, a warning, a threat. Don't you dare come back here. If I see you here again, I'm going to whatever. Um, a prediction, an expression of hope. I just hope that, that this is, uh, that, that, you know, I'll survive today or something like that. Or I'll learn what I need to learn. But if a character does that, again, that is something that creates anticipation. So you will tend in a well-made movie to see that sort of technique being used. Uh, the thing you don't want to have is the audience wondering, where is this going? I don't know where this is going. Or the reader. I, I've read 10 pages. I have no idea what the story is. Well, if you put these little things in there, embroider the script with these elements, these tools, then you're going to help allay that problem. Um, the next tool that you see is dramatic irony. Uh, this is uh, one where a character knows, uh, the audience knows more than one or more of the characters. And it has some salient, uh, that creates a, a salient issue for the scene. The character doesn't know there's somebody behind the uh, wall waiting with a gun to shooting them. You know? So what are we worried about? Why are we in, in tune with that? Because uh, attuned to it? Because <clears throat> we want to find out what happens when the character figures it out? This moment of recognition. Oh my God. Uh, or um, it could be obviously a threat that creates suspense. It could be used for comic irony um, to people that uh, uh, are talking and we don't know that one of them is sleeping in the other person's bed without them knowing about it. You know, that every scene, uh, there's a movie, uh, The Shop Around the Corner, which was remade decades later. Uh, as you've got mail, about two clerks, the first one was about two clerks working in a shop who are each corresponding to somebody that they haven't met yet that they are in love with. And they don't realize that it's actually each other. And in person, they can't stand each other. So every scene, every scene that has those two in it uh, has an extra layer of excitement to it. And it leads us to this anticipation What's going to happen when they find out the truth? Um, so that's dramatic irony. And then the fourth tool is the one that gets all the press uh, and that you'll hear about relentlessly is this idea of dramatic tension, uh, which is where the three act structure comes in. And that's just character wants something. We care about that character and we are in suspense about whether they're going to get it. And that one you can sustain for a whole feature film or longer. Um, and you'll see it though in subunits. Uh, you're asking if you deconstruct it, what are you going to find in the screenplay? Well, you will s tend to see one unifying tension. And the, the main tension, that one unifying tension, will boy get girl, will girl get boy, will girl get girl, whatever uh, you, how you define it. Um, uh, that um, can be enough to, that, that creates the, the unity in a movie that makes it feel like one movie rather than a whole bunch of scenes stuck together. It's like, what was that about? Well, it was about whether the person would get this. Okay, that's what it's about. Uh, but within that, within the subunits, you have these dramatic scenes. And dramatic scenes can use the same structure. Uh, a dramatic scene will still have a character who wants something and there's obstacles. And if you, you know, if you study acting, you'll see that it's drilled into the actors. What's my objective in this scene? What am I trying to do? What is my action? Uh, it's not about emotion. It's about trying to do something. Uh, drama. Drama comes from doing. It's doing things. It's action. Um, so um, within each scene, once you have a connection to a character, you will see this same thing happening. Uh, yes, you have a uh, character who, um, Silver Linings Playbook, 
the character wants to reconnect with his ex-wife. Okay, that's the main question, main tension. Is he going to do that or not? Then within a scene, he may be uh, fighting with his father about whether he should, you know, go out for a run or fix the, the, the window that he broke, right? That's a very different tension, but it's still a tension. And it's built in within a particular scene. Um, you'll also tend to see in successful movies what the, the sequences that um, are, they tend to be invisible to a viewer, but to a writer who's trying to create a movie, they're very useful building blocks. And that is um, seeing, and those, uh, seeing a mini movie, a mini story within the bigger one that is a component of it. And those also tend to have three act structures. That it's a nested structure. Uh, you have multiple iterations at different levels. You have at the scene level, character wants something, there's obstacles. But the scenes are in service of a bigger tension. A character has to go through multiple things to try to get to what they want within the, the sequence. And then um, the sequences themselves are built into the overall three-act structure of a dramatic piece. And, and there are issues about how many acts do you have? What are the acts? Should they be four? Should there be none? Um, it's, it's really about how you define the acts and whether you're playing with dramatic tension. If you have, um, uh, if you have a, a main issue about a character wanting something, and there's obstacles. You have to know who that character is. You have to connect with them emotionally. You have to know what the obstacles are. You have to, and then once you know those things, you, preferably what's at stake, then the question's been raised, the tension is out there. That's your end of your first act. If you don't know those things, you're not going to have any tension. If a character wants something, if there's two characters, let's say you're in a park and you see two uh, people playing tennis, and they're going at it. They're really going at it. Uh, it's not necessarily dramatic to you if they're strangers. It's just two people really going at it. And whether one wins or the other doesn't mean anything. But if you know one of them, and you know that person, you love them dearly, and you found out that they bet their entire uh, fortune on this one game, and you also know that the guy they're playing against, or girl, is a hustler, who, who suckered them into it, then that changes your experience of it. You are now f hanging on every shot and you're hoping that somehow they're going to overcome this. And th that information that makes it dramatic, that's your first act. You, you can't have an, a drama without that. Um, and then the third act simply refers to the resolution of that tension. Because you... <laughs> If you don't have the third act, that means you, you found out that your, your dearly beloved brother bet everything on this game against the hustler, and it's really intense, and then, oh, I gotta go. And we don't find out who wins. It, oh, you could probably do that. You probably, people would get a little upset. The audience would feel incomplete. So that's what that three acts is. So deconstructing it, those are the elements that, that you would find. And these, these are the pieces that are keeping us involved uh, from one stage, from one moment in the story to the next. That's a long answer. Oh, <laughs>